Hey, man, let's give God another hand of praise. Do this real quick. Let's all stand to our feet. We're going to make a quick declaration. Say this. Say, I receive, I receive everything, everything, everything that God has for me. Has now lift one hand. Let's say it again. Say, I receive, I receive everything, everything that God has for me. In Jesus' name, amen. Now give somebody a high five right next to you. You can be seated. Some of y'all are going to start carrying some hand sanitizer with you when you come to church, I can tell. <laughs> All you germaphobes are like, okay, elbow. <laughs> How about a fist bump, Pastor? No. I want to continue talking this morning about favor. Somebody say favor. Favor is evidence when your life is favored, when, when you are doing something that you can't explain without there being the unseen God helping you. When, when things break out and you just meet the right person at the right time. When you went from having a job to owning a business if that's your desire. When you shouldn't get to the head of the line, but somehow you get to the head of the line. This is favor. When you shouldn't have an opportunity, but you do have an opportunity. These, this is favor. When, when you don't have the degree and they give you the job anyway. When you don't have the certification or the qualification, but they give you the job anyway. This is favor. This is the favor of God on your life. And it's very important because the favor of God on your life verifies and validates to the world and unbelievers that there is somebody or something at work behind the scenes in your life. Without the favor of God on your life, if everything you can accomplish, we can explain by your intellect, by your looks, by your upbringing, by um, all the effort you put in, you're no different than the world. That doesn't mean don't press towards the mark and don't try because Christians, we ought to be the absolute best on uh, the job site with regards to effort, energy, um, being honest, being upright, not stealing from the company. I need three people to say amen to that. Amen. So, uh, when we go through life and everything we accomplish is explainable, then it's difficult to explain to people that don't believe in God that there actually is a God at work. However, when you are living in the favor of God and what you are attaining, accomplishing, what you're seeing happen in your life... If, when the favor of God is so evident on your life, it causes people to ask questions. I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, Crystal and I, we have three kids, Haley, Walker Lee, and Trinity. And, and we not only teach the favor of God, we believe the favor of God is on our life. We see it time and time and time and time and time and time again. Uh, but one of the things we like to do is we like to go on uh, cruises. Anybody ever been on a cruise? Just wave at me. You know exactly what I'm talking about. We like to go on cruises, particularly Disney cruises. I have found that the mouse is trapped on the boat and the kids get to see the mouse whenever we go on these Disney cruises. But we go and we go to all these exotic places and we do the snorkeling and the fishing and we do the boat riding and, and the jet skiing and we just do it all and we have a great time. But, but the, the, the boats will have, you know, sometimes, I don't know, 2,500 people, 5,000 people on them. They're big boats. And I think you're supposed to call them a ship. But uh, in, the, in the process, we'll, we'll, our kids will go to these clubs and like the, the kids clubs and they'll play and, and whatnot. And uh, one, one year in particular, one year in particular, Walker came to me and he said, dad, I said, what? He said, they told me that I can't talk about Jesus in the kids club. And I said, really? I said, what did you say? He said, oh, I'm sorry you think that, but I'll never stop talking about Jesus. <laughs> I said, well, problem solved. I said, let me know if they give you any trouble. He said, okay. So, um, we go through and, 
they, they have these, these shows at night on the boats and, and have videos of all this. I should have brought a video, but uh, they have these shows at night and there'll be a thousand people in the room. And, and every time we ever go on these things, they say, hey, I'm going to pick somebody from the audience. I'm going to take you that one right there. And we're not even on the front row. We'll be back in the back corner somewhere. And they'll be like, I want that one right over there. And it'll be one of mine. And so this last year, they're sitting there and they bring Walker Lee. They're like, we're going to pick somebody from the audience at random. How about you right over here? There's a thousand kids in there and they're always grabbing my kids. And I know what it is. It's the favor of God on their life. So they bring him down. And they start talking, and, and, and God bless all children, but, but my children are, are not unaccustomed to speaking in front of people because we have them do that. Um, I'm not saying everybody has to, but we do. Um, we, we win the lost on a personal basis. In other words, personal evangelism is an extremely high priority in my home, and it's not that uncommon for me to pull up see somebody in front of a store or at a gas station or a restaurant or whatever, and I'll just stop the car, put it in park, and I'll tell the kids, go win that person to Jesus right now. And they're like, yes, sir, boom, and they're out. And they're, hey, how you doing? Um, pray. And, and they've even started to develop their own phrases, like their, their own entries into the conversation. And, and, and I said, man, just you know, wave at me if you need me. Because if they need me, I'm going to come out and I'm going to help them because I'm trying to raise them up in the way that they should go. Come on, somebody. And I love puppies and I tolerate kittens. But if you raise your children to cry over a lost puppy and ignore a lost soul, the world will just continue to be out of whack when the, when the next generation gets up there. But if we raise them and say, we're not saying don't love lost puppies, cry for them, go find them, all that other stuff. But the value of a soul, the value of something that was created in the likeness and image of God surpasses everything else. So we want their heart breaking for what breaks God's heart. Does that make sense? So we'll throw them out there and say, let's go do it. Or we'll say, hey, come with us. We're going to go. Where are we going? We're going soul winning. And let me tell you something. I've never been out on purpose, soul winning, witnessing, evangelizing, where it was 100% success rate. I should come up with the percentage because it's probably more like 30, 20%, something like that. Because most of the conversations, you're, you're, you're talking to somebody cold. Like they don't know you, you don't know them. And you're just trying to find a quick way into the conversation. You can say, listen, I want to tell you about Jesus because he loves you very much. And most of the time, people are not exactly ready to engage with that. And, and how could you really blame them? You know, we're talking about walking through the mall. They were there thinking about buying some sketchers that they saw on TV. You know what I'm talking about? And you're like, how's the condition of your soul? There's people in this church right now. That's how you came to New Heights Church is because I met you and I saw you and I stopped what I was doing and I said, let me have a conversation with you. So we take our kids out there. So it's not just the favor of God on my kid's life. We're raising them up. But they sit there and they bring this kid up and they said, uh, what are you, uh, is what's your name? My name's Walker. And then they said, well, where are you from? And of course the, he says, Texas. And they're like, oh, should have known. Ha ha ha. Walker, Texas Ranger. It's always the same joke. <laughs> so everybody laughs, whatever he says, he says, he says, wow. He says, he says, uh, are you nervous? He says, no, sir. He says, you're not nervous. He says, well, what do you want to be when you grow up? A preacher. And like 50% of the crowd is like, and the other 50 is like, did he say preacher? <laughs> so it happens all the time. My kids get drawn up with these kind of things. It's the favor of God. So the young man that told my, my son to stop telling people about Jesus in the kids club, uh, the last night of the cruise, it was like midnight and we were uh, at a bar. Y'all know Crystal. We were at the bar at midnight with our kids. 
if you've ever been on a cruise, you know that they multitask those rooms. So it'll be a bar at one time, then it'll be a karaoke party at another, and it'll be a, you know, a, a puppet show the next day or whatever. So we were sitting there, the kids were singing karaoke, and they're all singing, and all of a sudden, this, this person comes up to me and said, excuse me, uh, is your son's name Walker? And I said, yes, it is. And they said, like Texas Ranger? I'm like, stop it with the Texas Ranger jokes. I said, I said yeah, that's him. They said, man, they said, he's really made an impact in our kids' club. I said, really? He said, yeah, he's, he's friended a lot of the kids that were you know, kind of pushed over to the side. He was really helping people. Is there any way? I, I know somebody that would really like to talk to him before uh, you guys leave. It's midnight. We're getting off the boat in eight hours. I said, I said, sure. I said, can I go get him? I said, yeah. So we're waiting, standing in the bar. Not uncommon. Crystal closes the bar down. <laughs> so they bring the young man over and, and he says, he says, he says, man, I, I've just never met a kid like this. And the kid, the, the, the guy pulls out a, a note and he opens it up and he goes, look at this. And I didn't know it. Walker had written him a letter. And in the letter, he said, I so enjoyed hanging out with you on this Disney cruise. And I want you to know that Jesus loves you more than you could ever imagine. And he has a massive plan for your life. And I'm believing God with you that it's all going to come to pass. Your friend, Walker. And I thought, son of a gun. So now everybody's sitting there and their eyes are starting to get wet. So I got the guy who told Walker to stop talking about Jesus now holding a letter crying about the fact that Walker was talking to him about Jesus. I've got this other young lady that works there, and she says, what is it about these kids? I said, oh, that's the Lord. She said, what? I said, that's the Lord. I said, are you feeling something? She said, yeah, I'm just feeling like something. I said, yeah. I said, I said here's what you should do. You should ask them to pray for you. She goes, well, how do we do that? I said, well, first off, Crystal, put your drink down, baby. <laughs> I said, let's just hold hands right here. They're like, right here? I'm like, right here. They said, well, what? I said, I said, do we close our eyes? I said, close them, don't close them, whatever. No problem. So they're sitting there. I said, I said Walker Lee, why don't you pray? <laughs> he said, he goes, oh God, Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end, the first and the last, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for us and miraculously rose from the dead. And I'm, I'm hearing the, the two workers and they're just starting to sniffle. And I just thank you, God, for bringing these people in my life in Jesus' name. And he gives this beautiful prayer, amen. And then they look like, like, like they've seen a ghost. And they had. See, the Holy Ghost not in a cage. The Holy Spirit is waiting on us. And it was the favor of God on my offspring that gave them the opportunity to minister at the level that they could. There's no way that they should be picked as often as they're picked. There's no way that they should be being selected for these different things. But the favor of God on their life makes moments like this possible where people have to ponder, wait a minute, how is it possible that this keeps happening? How is it possible that you keep getting the promotion? How is it possible that you keep getting blessed? How is it possible that you keep setting sales records at your business? How is it possible that you keep getting the accolades? It is the favor of God on your life. And I'm gonna, in, in just a few short minutes, I'm gonna show you four keys to how you can maximize favor and what favor follows, and then I'm gonna tell you why. But if you're gonna understand anything about favor or really anything about God, you must understand kingdom. Everybody say kingdom. kingdom. Has anybody ever driven a rental car before? Have you ever gotten the oil changed in your rental car? That's because you consider it's well-being somebody else's responsibility. But when the light goes off in your car, you drive it and get the oil changed. 
That's the difference between understanding kingdom and evacuation. You were not saved to be evacuated from planet earth. You were saved to rule and reign right here. Heaven is beautiful and you will go there if you know Jesus, but even there you will not stay. We're coming back to earth to rule and reign with him. The devil doesn't even care when people get saved. Selah. The only reason he cares at all, even a fragment, is because Jesus told Nicodemus, you cannot see the kingdom unless you are born again. The only reason he even cares at all if somebody gets born again is because now you have the opportunity to see the kingdom. Because the devil does not rule and reign hell. Hell is his penalty. He is not immune to the flames. So people that reject Jesus will be in the same condition that he is in in hell. He will not be poking everybody with a pitchfork. That's his penalty. He's not in hell right now. He's in, he's in or on earth, however the, legal, the best legal way to say it would be. He's the prince of the power of the air. One place says he's the prince of this world. But you're supposed to be a king and a priest right here. And when Jesus died, he died to restore our authority here. Because there was only one thing that was created by God in God's likeness and image and given dominion in this realm. Everything else is counterfeit. So you were made in God's likeness and his image And so he's in heaven and he says, I have made something that looks like me and sounds like me and I have given it my authority and I want humanity to rule and reign planet earth. I want you to tell the zebra, you're a zebra. I want you to tell the giraffe, you're a giraffe. And I want to, I want you to rule and reign. And then Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. All of a sudden they still look like God potentially could sound like God, but they lost the authority that God had given them here. So when Jesus came, he came to reestablish the authority of the kingdom of heaven right here. That's why he said this constantly, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In John 4, he said this, he said, the time is coming and now is when when, when, when people will worship in spirit and in truth. His cousin John, who went before him, John the Baptist, constantly said the same thing. Repent, 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 repent. But repent does not mean to say you're sorry. Repent comes from two words in the Greek, meta noe. Uh, Honest to God, I really appreciate the attention. I can feel you guys pulling this out of me. I wasn't even going here this morning. I was going a different direction. Metanoe, to change your mind, to change how you think. Because listen to this, this is so powerful. If all you're thinking about is getting out of here, earth is a rental car, it's somebody else's problem. And everything just perpetuates. But if you metanoe, if you change your mind, if you change your thought patterns, You change how you think and you go, wait a minute, he put me here to run this thing. Now you met a no way. Now you change what you think because as a man thinks, so is he. So if I'm just thinking I'm a survivor trying to get the heck out of here, that's all you're going to do. And you'll smoke dope and skip rope with the rest of everybody else. But if you change how you think and you start going, hold the phone, he made this for us. We're supposed to be ruling. Right. He said, take dominion. Dominion means dominate. You're supposed to be winning. Now, thanks be to God, which always caused me to triumph through Christ Jesus. You're supposed to win. At what? All things, apparently. So when we met in no way, when we repent, repent does not mean I'm sorry. It means to change how you think. How? 
you are transformed by the renewing of your mind. Because you can't, believe, you can't put faith in something you don't believe, and you can't believe something you don't know. So the first thing you got to do is you got to get it in your knower. You got to get it in your mind. I'm a part of a different kingdom. You start recognizing you're a part of a different kingdom, you'll even change how you behave. Because the kingdom of God doesn't behave that way. Kingdom of God, men don't cheat on their wives. The kingdom of God, men aren't ugly to their children for the sake of being ugly. That's not how the kingdom operates. I'm in a different kingdom. I'm in a completely different, uh, a different spectrum. I'm in the world, but I am not of the world. You become the best employee that your employer has ever seen because people in our kingdom don't lie. And you, you begin to change your, your, your uh, actions based off of what the kingdom is like because the kingdom has a culture. And in the culture of the kingdom, there's certain things we do and don't do. In the culture of the kingdom, we honor our parents. Well, you don't understand. My parents did this. My parents did that. Blah, blah, blah. It doesn't say anything about you having to... Uh, uh, act like they didn't do something wrong, but you can honor them. Culture of the kingdom changes how you behave when you begin to understand kingdom. Now all of a sudden you begin to understand kingdom is, is, is what God has actually sent Jesus to come and reestablish. And you're an ambassador. You're a citizen of that kingdom. Now all of a sudden you recognize you have some rights, but your rights have to be enforced or you'll just act like the world. And you'll go to heaven, and you really will. You'll go to heaven. If you're saved, born again, washed in the blood of Jesus, you'll go to heaven. But if you want to see the kingdom manifest here, if you just decide, I want to be a radical Christian, I want to see the kingdom of heaven manifest here because you want to see our children, all of our children, our offspring go to the next level, it's going to have to be them standing on our shoulders. They're going to have to understand the foundation of the kingdom, which Jesus came in and says, repent. The kingdom is right here, right now. That means you can't be looking in the future all the time. One day, one day, one day, one day, one day. Today is one day. Somebody's got to put their foot down and decide I'm a member of a new kingdom. I'm a member of a completely different kingdom. Well, I don't understand. Of course you don't understand it. You're not a part of the kingdom. Jesus said you wouldn't understand it. What do you mean don't understand it? You can't see the kingdom until you're born again. Saul knew the Bible better than we do right now, yet he could not see that Jesus was the son of God until the scales came off by his new birth. You can have it. Jesus said the same stuff to everybody that followed him that he said pretty much to the disciples, but they couldn't hear. He said, well, they don't have eyes to see. They don't have ears to hear. Why not? They're not a part of the kingdom. How's that? They weren't born again. Well, what's that mean? Well, when you get born again, you get in the kingdom. Now you, now you get in the family of God. Now you can see the kingdom. Once you can see the kingdom, now you can begin to uh, know some things. And when you begin to know some things, you can begin to believe some things. And once you begin to believe some things, now it can actually manifest here because it takes you knowing it and believing it for it to manifest here because that's how he established everything getting thy kingdom come here as it is in heaven. So you begin to walk different. You begin to talk different. You begin to recognize what comes out of my mouth is outlandishly important. You stop calling it cold and flu season. I call it blessed and highly favored season. Totally healed from the top of my head to the soles of my feet season. That's what I call it. That's nuts. I know. By the world standards, that's crazy. Well, what if you never see it? Well, I'm not walking by what I see. I'm walking by faith. Amen. Well, what happens if it doesn't work? That's impossible, sir. Amen. Excuse me? Impossible. What do you mean impossible? His word will never return void. Well, what happens if you die before you see it? Heaven's not a penalty. <laughs> what do you mean? It means now thanks be unto God, which always caused me to triumph through Christ Jesus. I can't lose. It's impossible for me to lose. The only way to lose is quit. The only way to lose is to not engage in the fight. Let me give you four keys real quick. 
When it comes to favor on your life, favor follows faithfulness. You should write this down. Favor follows faithfulness. David was tending sheep. Everybody else was standing there asking for the oil. And David was out tending his sheep. And the favor of God hit him, poured on his life. And literally, he was anointed the next king of Israel for just being faithful. Favor follows faithfulness. If you don't know anything else, get faithful. If you don't know anything else, get faithful. God can do things with faithful people that he couldn't do with absolute geniuses that are sporadic. I come to church sometimes. I come to church when I feel like it. You know, I just feel like, you know, going to church today. It's been six months. I probably need it. (laughs) Keep playing games. Favor follows faithfulness. I can tell you where I'll be Sunday morning, 30 years from now, right now. I'll be in the house of God, magnifying God, thanking God. What happens if everything goes good? That's exactly what's going to happen, and I'll be thanking him for it. What happens if everything goes bad? I'll thank him that I get to be a partaker of some of the sufferings of Christ. Why? Because I didn't give him my life as a loan. I gave him my life. That means he sets my calendar. And I don't neglect the gathering of saints, which is the met, which is the uh, uh, which is the and the, as the manner of some do. I don't stop getting together and magnifying Jesus just because some people did. Well, what happens? What happens when people come and go? They come and go all the time, literally. We teach the same when they're here. We teach the same when they're not. But favor follows faithfulness. Because sometimes you can just be in the right place that faithfulness has brought you and all of a sudden the blessing can hit you. All of a sudden the blessing can get on you. Number two, favor follows honor. Favor follows honor. Honor cannot be taken. You can't make somebody honor you. Favor can, of honor can only be given. Respect is earned, but honor is given. Honor is a decision that I make to honor the people around me. I'm not waiting to see how good of a person you are before I open the door for you. I'm gonna honor you. And honor begats servants where you have decided I'm going to serve the kingdom of God. I'm gonna serve the house of God. Remember Jesus? He said, I didn't come here to be served, but I came here to serve. David was anointed to be the next king of Israel. And one of the the next encounters we see is he's delivering lunch to his older brothers on the battlefield. Because even the king of Israel, anointed by God, walked in honor and served. And the favor of God just increased and increased and increased and increased and increased. The favor of God increased and increased and increased and increased and increased on his life. Because favor follows faithfulness and favor follows honor. And let me tell you something. The United States of America is grossly negligent in the area of honor. And shame on the church if that's how we look. It's not your job to determine if somebody has sinned or not. It's not your job to judge everybody sitting around you whether or not they look like you, smell like you, sound like you. Because favor follows honor. I've, I've heard men, and particularly men of God, because I just haven't served that many women of God just because, you know, things are upright in certain ways, but men of God, I've heard men of God say things that are nuts that you shouldn't repeat in a back alley 
and it'll go to the grave with me. Because I chose a long time ago to honor. And I know for a fact, every person walking around is a human being. And if you're going to base the level of honor that you send out of your life based off of what somebody does or doesn't, you're going to find some reasons to stop pretty soon. Favor follows honor. Favor follows faithfulness and favor follows honor. Number three, everybody said number three. I know I'm usually a lot more exciting than this, but this is super duper important. Super duper important. When you put a duper on it, Jake, that's when you know it's important. (laughs) Favor follows faithfulness, favor follows honor, and favor follows wisdom. Favor follows wisdom. Wisdom is simply, and you should write this down too, wisdom is applied knowledge. You might have the information but not apply it. That's unwise. But when you have the information, now you have the opportunity to apply it. That's wisdom. I'm going to tell you the secret to losing weight. You ready? Diet and exercise. It's not the knowledge that makes you have the result you're looking for. It's the application of the knowledge. Everybody and their donkey knows a good diet and exercise will get you closer to your fitness goals. It's the application of that knowledge. That's wisdom. Favor follows wisdom, the application of knowledge. Maybe, maybe you've never been taught how to go to church. I'm about to tell you how to go to church. As consistent as you absolutely can. Because when I'm up here teaching, I'm going to finish off a thought here, and then we'll pick up oftentimes that same topic the next week. But if you're a once a monther, or once every couple months, or just when you feel like, you know, I just need, I just, it makes me feel so good when they sing that worship, I cry, and then I'm good for another three or four months. You're just as weak as you were the first time you came. Because you're not able to pick up the knowledge that will be able to apply it and then actually walk in wisdom. Because what you're actually supposed to do, Dad, is you're supposed to come in here, get this, digest it, roll it around a little bit, talk it over over the dinner table, and then when you're, when you're with your kids, you're supposed to say, baby, let me tell you something about favor. They can be five, six, 12 years old, and you temper it, you temper it to their age, and then you teach them this. This is what church is supposed to be. Supposed to come in here, get the knowledge so that you can apply it. And once you apply it, it becomes wisdom. Once wisdom is is activated in your life, favor begins to follow wisdom. I will. One One of the one of the greatest things you could ever learn is this. You should write this down too. And if you don't take notes, how are you gonna remember any of this? If you if The more wisdom you have, the less miracles you need. And now God can give you the big ones instead of the little baby miracles. Now he'll part the Red Sea in front of you instead of helping you bend over and tie your shoe. But you apply the knowledge of God and it becomes wisdom. And favor follows the wise. Favor follows those 
who are taking the information of the gospel of Jesus Christ and applying it to their life. And not in a religious way, not in a dogmatic way, not in a hard way, not over the top of somebody, not trying to beat somebody over the head with it. You're just applying it in your life. And then you come in a place like this and, and, and you sit down at lunch and you're eating your, uh, you know, your fried chicken. Come on, somebody. And you look at your kids that you had in kids church, if not every Sunday, nearly every single Sunday. Why? Because you only got a short window of time with them to get the word of God in them at all. So you get it in them, you teach them that it's a priority because they don't do what you say. They do what you do. Jesus is the most important thing in our life. We ain't been to church in six months. You're not telling the truth, mom. You're not telling the truth, dad. Because whenever we said it, and look, this is not at anybody. You're in church. I'm just talking about favor and how it actually, what it's attracted to. It's attracted to faithfulness. It's attracted to honor and it's attracted to wisdom. Last, last point. Last point. This is a big one. It's going to hit a lot of you. <laughs> it's going to hit a lot of you. You're going to like it. We've been, eating, we've been eating lima beans for the last 30 minutes. I'm about to give you the dessert. You ready? Favor follows fighters. I can tell most of y'all still have a little edge to you. That's good. God's going to use that. Because favor follows fighters. Why? Because you're supposed to be ruling and reigning here. And it bothers you when you walk out and somebody's standing on the battlefield cursing your God. Oh, it's not a nine foot giant anymore. In the physical, it's the nine foot giant standing outside your house telling you you're never going to make it. It's the nine foot giant telling you that the report's gonna be the end of you and you're gonna die because of what you found out. It's the nine foot giant that says you're never gonna make it to the top. It's the nine foot giant that says you can't get a degree. It's the nine foot giant that says you can't find a house. It's the nine foot giant that says you're not gonna be able to make it. It's the nine foot giant that says your marriage is gonna fall apart and break. It's the nine foot giant that says you're less than. It's, It's all these different things that are yelling at you and you still have just enough David in you. You have just enough David in you to say, no, I don't know if he can use anybody, but if he can use anybody, he can use me. I'll fight that sucker. Because favor follows fighters. Why? Because it's all about the kingdom. Why was David willing to fight? It was his kingdom. He had already had the anointing. He had already had the oil poured on his life. Everybody else was fighting for Saul's kingdom and David was fighting for his kingdom. Favor follows fighters. I think there's some fighters in here. No, 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 no. Some of y'all are like shadow boxing in your heads like pastor said. No, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but spiritually, we're very violent. Spiritually, we're very violent because favor follows fighters. The Lord whispered to me Friday morning. I was with him. We were having just a great time. He told me this little beautiful truth that I'd never seen. David came and, and he was there and he was, he was faithful to do what his dad said. He was honoring his brothers and even the captains that were over his brothers by bringing them all some food. He was wise enough to make sure that even the sheep that he was supposed to be tending, he left them with somebody. He didn't just leave his responsibilities. 
He was faithful. He walked in honor and he was wise and he was willing to fight. And when Saul found out about it, he comes over and Saul says, here, wear my armor. He puts his armor on him. He hands him his, his, his shield. He puts his helmet on him. You can see this little boy. The Bible says that Saul was head and shoulders above every other man. He was humongous. And this, this, this little shepherd boy, maybe a teenager, was just able to wiggle his whole body in it. And he says, man, I can't wear this. He said, I'm going I'm to take what I know. Hand me my staff, and I, I brought my slingshot. And he ran out there. And when he got out there, the Bible says that Goliath said, you guys sent a dog in front of me. He said, I'm going to kill this dog. I'm going to feed him to the birds. And David said, you ain't killing nothing, Jack. I'm killing you. I'm going to cut your head off, feed you to the birds today. You come against me with all these Philistine armies, but I come against you in the name of the Lord. Effectively, he's saying, you're, you're messing with my kingdom. Favor follows fighters. Why do you have favor? You have favor so that you can fight more. Amen. <laughs> You didn't have favor so you could sit on the couch and eat tacos. You have favor so you can fight more. You're favored to fight. But, but here, here's the thing the Lord whispered to me. David did not take any defensive weapons. Only offense. Saul said, you need my helmet in case something hits you. David said, ain't nothing hitting me. He said, you're going to need my, 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 my breastplate in case you know, somebody shoots an arrow at me. He said, I ain't worried about that either. He said, take my shield. He said, I don't need your shield. He said, why don't you need my shield, David? He said, thou, O Lord, are a shield about me. Favor follows fighters. It's time to stop playing defense. It's time to stop thinking defense. Oh, I'm just trying to hold on. Boy, the devil's really been hitting me. Oh, my goodness gracious. It's so bad. The sky is falling. Let me tell you something. If the sky falls, God will pick it right back up and put it where it's supposed to be. I ain't walking around playing defense the rest of my life. Because favor follows the fighters. I remember this, is, this isn't politically correct anymore, but my dad told me when I was a kid, he said, if you think you're going to be in a fight, hit them in the mouth. I said, sir? He said, if you think there's no other way and it's inevitable, hit them in the mouth. I said, really? He said, really? I said, be right back, dad. Why? Because when it's inevitable, you got to get in the fight. Let me tell you something, and you might not want to know this. You're going to fight the rest of your life or be pushed around. And favor follows fighters. Favor follows those that say, I know what he said. I heard that giant screaming at me, but I came here to bring the fight to him. Where's your shield? Don't need it. Why? God himself it's my shield. What, what are you going to do? I'm going to sling this stone. Well, what could a stone do? That's exactly what they said about Jesus. The building block that was rejected became the corner stone of a whole new world. What could a stone do? I'll tell you what a stone will do. The rock of your salvation will bury himself in the forehead of your adversary. And cause your enemies to flee seven ways. And you don't just need the favor of God on your life so you can get a new car. And God bless new cars. I like cars. You need the favor on your life. Favor of God on your life. So you can fight at a higher level. Some of y'all been pushed around too much. Some of y'all been, been in the corner. And the devil's been threatening you all day long. Some of y'all, you, you spent 30 years thinking that you just need to survive until you get to heaven. Well, I came here to wash that bad doctrine out and say he didn't save you just to go to heaven. He saved you so that you would rule and reign here as a citizen of the kingdom of God. Hey. 
Hey guys, we just want to thank you for joining us online. We hope you enjoyed today's worship experience. Here at New Heights, we're passionate about two things, loving people and pointing them to Christ. So help us by liking, sharing, and commenting on everything you see come across our social media. It means the world to us. If you like what you experienced today, you can replay this message or any other message at www.newheightschurch.info. What about? <laughs>